like to welcome everyone, our members, our visitors, our visitors, please come back. We missed y'all. We haven't seen y'all in a while. Before I get started, I need to make sure God's creation is incredible. And when we ask Jesus to walk with us, we're asking the, the, uh, the King of the universe to walk with us. I am blown away when I look at creation. And as I look at creation, I think about um, God. Because only God can, can create. Only man can use God's creation to uh, for himself. And I've talked about this before, and I want to I want to bring it up again. And uh, secular science <coughs> tells us there there are about two trillion galaxies in the universe. And in those two trillion galaxies, we're, we're in the Milky Way galaxy. If you didn't know, we're in the edge. We have a perfect view of, of the universe from our standpoint. And I personally believe God made it that way so we can see out. But I also believe that God put us in a certain position so the universe could see in. Because this, we're in what we call the great sin experiment. Uh, according to scripture, we are the only planet that has, has fallen into sin. And uh, we could praise God for that, but... It's not so uh, wonderful for us here while we're in this ex sin experiment. But I want to take that uh, last statement back. It can be wonderful for us if we are in Christ. And that, that's what we've been studying Amen. in uh, in our Wednesday night Bible study. Is the in Christ, it's called the in Christ motif. Um, the, can you imagine 200 trillion? I can't even imagine uh, a thousand galaxies much less two trillion galaxies. And in each one of those galaxies, uh, some of the galaxies have like two billion stars. Our sun is a star. And some of the galaxies have one, million, one billion stars. I mean, uh, excuse me, a hundred billion stars. Can you, I can't, I can't imagine the vastness of our universe. It is, we're like, uh, we're not even a, a, a speck uh, on the planet compared to the universe. Now our earth is 24,000 miles in circumference, plus or minus. We have a 24 hour day and it takes one day for our earth to go 24,000 miles. How fast is that? A thousand miles per hour. That's, that's moving at a pretty good clip. Now, the sun itself is moving at a rate you will not believe. It's hard to fathom that our sun, we're moving a thousand miles an hour. Our sun is moving. <laughs> anyway, I'm, this is rough. I'm just going to, I'm not going to tell you. Because it goes right down to the, to the last one digits. 500,000 miles per hour, our sun is moving through the galaxy. That's nothing compared to how fast the galaxy is moving through space. I don't know how, sec this is from secular science. I don't know how they figured this out. I mean, they can't even get our speed right sometimes with a, with a radar detector. <laughs> how can they detect that the, the Earth is moving, I'm sorry, the galaxy itself is moving through the universe at 1.3 million miles per hour. Now, the, the, the galaxy's moving, the sun is moving, and the planet's moving. It is a miracle of God that we can stay fixed to this planet. How does the, how does the ocean stay where it is? I mean, we can say, oh, gravity, but can you see gravity? You know, if I... 
I do need a talk, and this is, I talk with it sometimes. And I need to write my notes down. But gravity, if I let this pencil go, it's going to fall to the floor. If, I, if it doesn't fall to the floor, there's a problem in here. But anyway, if you think about how fast this earth is. And oh, another illustration, if you want to see a beautiful illustration, you know, in our old textbooks in school, you, they have the illustration of what the, our, our solar system looks like in our little area. And it shows the sun in the middle, and it shows the planets going around, you know, ice. Let's not forget that the sun is traveling at 500,000 miles per hour through space. Guess what the planets are doing? They're not going in this circle like we've always thought. We've seen it on a flat piece of paper. The planets are actually moving in a hyperbola or, or what? There's a wire. It's kind of it's kind of a spiral, but there's another name for it. But it but you get what I'm talking about. It, every planet is is traveling and keeping up with the sun. There's a there's a beautiful illustration on the internet for that. If if um, I'm at a loss for words this morning. You No, you're way off there. Thanks. Don't be lower. The now uh, I'm really getting off. Uh, there's some folks that that aren't here today that hate my dead space, but sometimes I have to stop and think about what I'm going to say. <laughs> you know we. Uh, we see God's creation. Oh, I, I just can't believe it. I can't remember this. But anyway, it staggers the imagination. Our, our, our planet's moving. And I'm trying to wait. And in the middle of my sermon, I'm going to remember what I was supposed to say. Now, God has created... It's not coming to me. We get it. Thank you, Don. Yes, for him. No, that's not it. That's, that's good, though, darling. Thank you. Now, God has created this vast universe. And it's incredible that He also created us. And He created us in His image. And when, when God created the first human being, He named him Adam. And if you look up the word in Hebrew, Adam means mankind. I'm stalling. So I've got to pick me up. I'm honest. <laughs> so when Adam, when God made Adam, I, I believe that it says that God uh, took the dust of the earth. So to, to take the dust of the earth, if God was standing, he'd have to kneel down and take the dust of the earth. And, and he makes Adam. And I, if God was, that's incredible for God to kneel down. And he takes the dust of the earth and he forms it into this man. And he takes, I believe, and this is not anywhere in scripture or anything, but I believe he takes the man and he raises him up and he looks into him and he, and he blows into him. And, and, and Adam has to be staring right into the face of God. One day we're going to stare into the face of God. I think Amen. that's so incredible. Yes. But, uh, and I, I, there's no telling what he said. He says, well, he has to, he says something profound, I'm sure. And Adam, you know, for the first time, he's an adult when, when God creates him. And Adam, is the first man that was created. He is the prototype. And when God made the prototype, He breathed the breath of life into Adam. If you read the, 
the Hebrew, when it, said, it says he breathed a breath, that word breath, if you look it up, it says it's the masculine plural. It, it means that he breathed the breath of lives into Adam. And if you read Acts 17, 26, it said that God made every man from one blood. So we all came from the same blood. We all came from Adam. Even Eve was taken out of Adam. When God made Eve, he, he took a live rib out of Adam and he created Eve. Did he have to breathe any life into, into Eve? The, the, the rib was alive. So we're in Adam. And when Adam and Eve decided, God had told them not that they could eat from every tree of the garden. And except for one tree. And it was the, the tree of good and evil. God said, if you eat from that tree, I'm going to kill you. Did God say that? No, God says, if you eat from the tree, you're going to die. God was trying to warn Adam and Eve. And it's amazing how there was only one prohibition in the garden. One. We're talking about sinless beings. And we always talk about Christ had the nature of Adam after his fall. And it's true. Christ has the nature of Adam as to respond. Because Adam was born, Jesus was born of a woman. The woman that, was, that he was born through was Mary. And she had been born to her parents and her parents. And, and, it, all, and it goes all the way back to Adam who sinned. So Jesus was born to Mary who was a sinner. So the, the flesh that Jesus has is the same flesh that you and I have. Amen. It says that Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are. But you know the spirit of prophecy says we need to be careful when we say that. Because Jesus was God. We need to be careful when we talk, talk about the, the humanity of Christ. We need to be very careful how we talk about it. I know what I believe about the humanity of Christ. I believe He had the same flesh we had. But it says in Romans that if you walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust. Of, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's also Galatians 5:16. I believe that Jesus never fulfilled the lust of the flesh because he always walked in the Spirit. He never, there was not a time when Jesus didn't walk in the Spirit. When Adam sinned, we were in. Adam. And it's said that it's not fair that it comes, the condemnation comes down to us. But before I finish my sermon, I hope this show that's not true. Now, let's go to uh, our Bible. And I want to go to uh, I want to go to Matthew chapter 21 in verse 33. Yeah, I'll be watching this video if, if I watch it. Sometimes I'm scared to watch my sermons. <laughs> anyway, and I'll remember what I was supposed to say. Uh, Matthew 21, verse 33. And this, this is a story, or this is a parable. And it says, here another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. And he leased it to, vine, to, the, to vine dressers and went into a far country. You know, God, going back to my original story, God created this vast universe, the vastness of the universe. He created that. Then He came and He created man. But can you, the, 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 the going from whoa, this great giant creation down to one man, Adam, 
it's, it's, that's just, to me, I'm blown away by that, how God, you know, I, we can, we're finite and God is infinite. How can we ever understand the infinite? Anyway, it says, there was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower, and he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Now when the vintage time drew near, he sent his servant to the vine dressers that they might receive the fruit. The vine, I'm going to paraphrase now. The vine dressers saw an opportunity here to, 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 to keep the prophets to themselves. So when he sent his slave to collect what he, the, the, the vine, the uh, landowner, the owner of the vineyard, Didn't he deserve to get uh, some uh, payment for allowing these uh, men to lease his property? They, I, I don't get that. They, they killed, they tortured the slaves and they killed the slaves. Then he sent his son. And what did they do to the son? They killed the son. Now, if you had... I'm going to bring it to this day and time. If you had a mango farm, B's probably going to have a mango farm when he gets to heaven. But he's always talking about mangoes. But if, he, if, you have a, if you had a mango farm and you let some men come in and take care of your mango farm and you were over in uh, Europe somewhere taking care of other business with your family and it was time for them to make a payment because they were leasing your mango farm, and they decided, well, we're not going to pay you. Wouldn't that upset you? Would you be, wouldn't you be living? You're in Europe. And you're expecting them to send the, the, the least money. Nothing comes. God... He, when he created Adam, Adam was his property. He made this man, or he made it, uh, himself in his image, and, and, he, and, and he became a living soul. God didn't get, I, I don't want to get into the, in the theology, but God didn't uh, give this man a soul. You need to look at that real close in the scriptures. God didn't give him a soul. He created him a soul. He made him a he made Adam the steward of this creation that he had. And God gave him one prohibition. He said, Don't eat of that tree. One prohibition. Adam ate of that tree. Adam was wrong. I mean, he had all these other trees. You know, it's like David sitting with Bathsheba. He had all these other wives, and he, he said, I want this one over here. You know, we are not owners. You know, that's, that's why Scripture says that one man can die for another man's sin. That's uh, Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20, if you want to look it up. It says the father cannot die for the sins of the, of the children, and the children cannot die for the sins of the parents. Ezekiel 18, 20, and Deuteronomy. Uh, those of you who are A students and want to look this stuff up. Deuteronomy 24, 16. The reason you can't die for another man's sins is because you don't belong to yourself. You can't give yourself for another man's sins because who do you belong to? 
You belong to God. You cannot give yourself as a sacrifice because you're giving away God's property. Mm. We are God's property. We, we that, that, I, I guess if I could rename my, the title of my sermon, We Are God's Property. Did you pick where you were going to be born? Did you pick where you were going to be born? We are blessed above all people on this earth to be born in this country. Amen. It's getting to a point to where, you know, it's all. We won't go there. But if you lived the time that we have lived, and some of you are, are a little bit upper in years than I am, then you can appreciate where God had put you. We could not pick where we were born, when we were born. Could you pick your parents? I mean, these, these answers are kind of obvious. Can you pick uh, your skin color? God has decided all these things in eternity before He made the first man. All this, all, every DNA he, he had, for every person that's ever been created was inside this man, Adam. God knew us before, before He created Adam. That's hard. That's a mystery to us. Don't try to figure it out because if you do, you can you find yourself in the, uh, as we used to call it, the insane asylum, which they don't have those anymore, I don't think. They did them all up. Can, can, you pick your, can you pick your brothers and sisters? Can you pick when you're going to die? I mean, if you committed suicide, you know, God knew that already anyway. He knows. God knows. Now, I want to get real specific here now. You couldn't pick your skin color. Can you pick your gender? <laughs> There's something going on in our country right now. And it's everywhere. It says, my body, my choice. God, in Romans chapter 1, those that wanted to go their own way, what did God do? What? What did, what did He do? I can't hear you. He let them go. He, it was their choice. You know, as parents, we, we can control our kids to a certain point, mm -hmm. to a certain age. And there's a point to where we can't control them anymore. We have to let them. And God lets us go. The, but the, does that mean that God doesn't love us because we become... Uh, yeah, that's a good word. Probably. I don't want to use any bad words today. Does God let us go? I mean, he, he, let, he allows us to go, but does He still love us? Yes. The, the prime, one of the prime examples in Scripture is Paul, the Apostle Paul. Had his back turned to God. He was, what would you call that, uh, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, uh, the, the unpardonable sin. God had his, at, Paul had his back to Adam, but he turned. He repented, and God accepted it. God accepts all of us. There's only one sin that can't be repented of. That's put your back turned to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit ain't going to flip you or turn you around. It's like the prodigal son when he was in the pig pen. What drew him out of the pig pen? He came to his senses. He came to his senses. God <laughs> has made us stewards over this. I am a steward over this. I'm a steward over everything that God gives me. Yes. My property, my, my, my animals, my house, everything is, is, is God's property. And He is looking at us with an expectation of us doing the right thing. I don't always do. But that's why we are here today. We want to ask God each and every day, as David asked God, 
He says, create in me a clean heart, oh God. Renew a right spirit in me. We want to worship God in spirit and in truth. My, uh, my text for today is Exodus 19, verse 5. I love this verse, and I want to tell you why I love this verse. Because it's God's Word, for one. And if you read the front of the bulletin, I got the uh, New English translation of this verse. And it says, uh, in the King James, it says, If you will obey me and keep my covenant, do y'all understand the word keep in Scripture? It means guard. It means appreciate. What's that? Cherish. cherish. It means cherish. Treasure. We want to treasure God's covenant. Why? Because we're His stewards. And He loves us. He created us. He, 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 God created us and then He redeemed us. One day He's going to come back and He's going to glorify us. That is, that is, that is our future. is glorification. To, then we can serve Him without sin. I can't imagine serving God without these. Yes, I can. I, that's what I want. That's what I want Him to do. Amen. Okay, let's go back to the verse. In, in uh, the King James, it says, if you will obey me. If you look up that word obey, it means listen attentively. Sorry, Marty, I, I kind of moved that. It, mean, it means listen attentively. God says, if you will listen to me and keep my covenant, then you will be a special possession out of all the nations. He says, I am going to make you special. You're not... I, it, it, it's a shame that Israel... There was only a few people in Israel that, that heard God. Caleb was one of them, and Joshua was the other one. They heard God. When the spies went into uh, Canaan to check it out, and they came back, how many of them had a good report? Two. Two. Two out of twelve had a good report. But corporately, we've talked about corporate. I'm not going to get into that. But corporately, Israel had to, to march through the desert corporately. One man's sin, Achan's sin, if you know the sin of Achan, he took possessions from the enemy and buried them in his tent. One man caused, I think it was 3,000 deaths, or plus or minus, one, one of us, one of us, that's, I believe that corporately, we have to stand together. Now, when God says, listen to me attentively, I got a little, one more little nugget here. I usually keep my sermons short. <laughs> <laughs> All right, amen. Thank you. Now, when God says, listen to me, what does he mean by listen to me? I mean, when, he, when God's speaking to us, he speaks, through, he speaks to us through this. But I want to add, add exhibit B. This is exhibit A. Exhibit B. Now, I've been preaching about this for, I don't know, forever. But I want to read this one more time because when God says listen to me, we want to hear Him. How are we going to know which way to go and what to do if we don't listen to God? If we just think, oh, I'm good, you know, because I do these things. I'm good because I, I serve other people. I'm good because I give money to the poor. You know, those things are, are they're not so simple. But if you think about it, what is the 
hardest thing that God has asked us to do. To die to ourselves. To die to ourselves. We belong to Him. I mean, there's stuff in the spirit of prophecy and in the scripture that will condemn each one of us. That's why we ask for the clean heart. We want to be ready when God comes. And we can't be ready if we don't listen to Him attentively. We can't go about thinking that we're good and then come to find out when, when we get to the pearly gates and we say, you know, I deserve to go in. And, and Jesus looks at us and says, I don't know who you are. I am sorry. I never knew you. I don't want to hear those words. God says, listen to me attentively. How, how can he say that to us? Do we belong to ourselves? No. We belong to him. So he has every right to say in his word, you have, you have sinned. Have we sinned? Did we sin like Adam or did we sin in Adam? Which one, which one is it? Do we sin like Adam? No, no, we can't be condemned by, for another man's sin. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say it like that. It's like this. If two people have AIDS and they got it being promiscuous and they come together and they have a child and that child is born with AIDS, is that child guilty of the parent's sin? No, but he's condemned. That is... Our, that's where we are. We are condemned because of Adam's sin. But we sin like Adam. You know, the scripture tells us if we, if we say we, we don't sin, that, that we're a liar. <coughs> anyway, I, I wanna, I'm going to wrap this up, but I, I want to read this. It says, and this comes from uh, the uh, Selected Messages, Book 1, page 32. The Lord's Messenger. And I looked for this for years, and my friend Andrew, who's not in here now, she finally, she, she's the one that pointed, pointed this out to me, and I looked for it because I, I knew it was here because I read it several years ago, and I wanted to find it again because this means everything to the Christian. This is why we can say, when God says, uh, why should we listen to the Seventh-day Adventist? Why are they God's church? Uh, Jesus is the prototype. Let's go to uh, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. It says, And He is the head, the head, there's only one head to the church. And that's Jesus Christ. Are we, are we in agreement there? Amen. Okay, and it says, the head of the body. Who is the body? The church. God, peace. Who is the beginning? It says Jesus is the firstborn. You know that word firstborn in, in the Greek is prototype? I, I'm sorry, prototokos. We get our word prototype from this word prototokos. You can look that up. It's, it's easy to look up in the Strongs. But Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. He is the, he, and everybody that comes after him is prototype number two, number three, number four. We're like Jesus. Jesus is the first prototype. Okay, the firstborn from the dead. We want to look at, uh, He is the head, and we are the church. Why can I say that? Because of the spirit of prophecy. The Adventist church is the only church that has the spirit of prophecy. Can anybody name another church that uses the spirit of prophecy? Mm -hmm. Now, I want to read you something that Jesus said. But we have to trust the pen, the pen of Ellen White. <coughs> Because she is God's 
messenger. She is not the message. Let's not get that mixed up. Mrs. White is a gracious woman who allowed herself to be used by Jesus. Early in my youth, I asked several times, I was asked several times, are you a prophet? I have re ever responded, I am the Lord's messenger. May God use each of us as a messenger. I know that many have called me a prophet, but I have no claim to the, this title. My Savior declared me to be His messenger. Your work, He instructed me, is to bear my word. This, this, we can't get around that. Jesus said, your work is to bear my word. Strange things will arise, and in your youth, I set you apart to bear the message to the erring ones. To carry the word before unbelievers and with pen and voice to reprove from the word actions that are not right, exhort from the word, from the Bible. I will make my word open to you. It shall not be as a strange language. He says, I will make my word open to you. In true eloquence of simplicity, with voice and pen, the messages that I give shall be heard from one who has never learned in the schools. She only graduated third grade. My spirit and my power shall be with you. Be not afraid of man, for my shield shall protect you. It is not you that speaketh. I want to say that. It is not you that speaketh. It is the Lord that giveth the message of warning and reproof. If I read this in another church, they would probably pick up stones to stone me. But we believe on Amos chapter 3, verse 7, where it says, if I do anything, I'm going to reveal it to my prophets. Thank you, Deborah. It is the Lord that giveth us the message of warning and reproof. Never deviate from the truth under any circumstances. That's pretty serious. Give the light that I shall give you. It's pretty, that's pretty explicit. The messages for these last days shall be given in books. And I hear this all the time, that we wouldn't need Ellen White's writings. What do you mean? We wouldn't need... Jesus' voice to us through Ellen White? Is that what we say? And I, I understand, I believe I understand that Mrs. White even said we wouldn't need the spirit of prophecy if we read our Bibles right. But you know, there's one other thing that we don't think about. If Eve hadn't sinned and ate the apple, we wouldn't need the Bible. I mean, we need God and His Word. And that's why I'm, I'm saying when in Exodus chapter 19, verse 5 says, listen to me. Are we going to listen to what I'm telling you about God? Are you going to listen to God, what He's trying to tell you about Himself? There's things in, 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 the, in the Spirit of Prophecy that are very pointed. If you read them and pick them out, it's going to tell you things like how to dress. What to put on? That's like, whoa. <laughs> you know, it was only one bite of an apple. Or, uh, if you read the Spirit of Prophecy, it says apple. Hmm. Well, the Spirit of Prophecy says it is. Are we going to go against what Jesus said? Hmm. If Jesus is the Spirit of Prophecy, are we going to go against what He said? Anyway. <laughs> Okay, never deviate from the truth under any circumstances. Give the light, I shall give. The messages for these last days shall be written in books. Plural. Books. You want to know God? Pick up one of these books. He, 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 he listen to me. Did Israel listen to God? Where is Israel today? Spiritual Israel is here with us. Literal Israel, genetic Israel is over in 
scattered. Thank you, Mary Jane. It said, it says, the, the, the messages for these last days shall be written. These are not my words. Please. I'm reading this right out of the selected messages. Page 32. Selected messages, book one, page 32. The messages for these last days shall be written in books and shall stand immortalized to testify against those who once rejoiced in the light but who have been led to give up because of the seductive influence of, of evil. Mm -hmm. We have a foe that we can't compete against without Christ, yeah. without being in Christ. Mm -hmm. we are, we're, we're lost without Christ. This foe hates God so bad that he wants us dead. Because he knows. But there's one thing about it. If you're in Christ, he can't touch you. You have all the power you need if you are in Christ. My closing song, or our closing song, is number 340.
Because in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen.